in Germany, something about that there was a, there was a demonstration going on. It was in Berlin. Yeah. And that somebody took they took some like stands or something and threw them up on the stage. And then they thought you weren't going to come back for the second set because there was a long pause or something. That sounds vaguely familiar. Oh yeah, that happened, but it wasn't quite as simple as that. A student, we did a sound check in the afternoon. There were some student revolutionaries came down there because that's when that was a trend, you know, real popular yeah. in uh, Germany. And they came down to the sound check and they asked whether or not we would assist them with a political event. And I said, well, what did you have in mind? And they said, there's going to be 8,000 kids here tonight and most of them have never demonstrated before, so we want you to tell them to come with us. And I said, yeah, <laughs> where, where are you going? Aiding and abetting. And they implied that, uh, it, well, they said, it's a very cold night and it would be nice to have something warm like a fire. <laughs> at the Allied Command Center, which was right around uh, the corner. So I said, I told them that I thought that was bad mental health. And so they got pissed off about it and they came back and tried to wreck our concert. And when we went on stage, there was about 200 kids in the audience with red flags and cans of paint and cherry bombs and hard objects. And we started throwing things at the stage and marching around and chanting, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh and, and all this other crap. And so uh, we had to play in the middle of that. We had to do a, uh, like about three hour concert. So we started playing and we just kept on going. Then we took our intermission. And, well, before we took our intermission, there was a scene where they tried to rip up a, uh, they had these restraining fences like you may have seen at places. They're steel or tubular steel about like this. And these had concrete feet. And a bunch of kids picked the things up and tried to throw it onto the stage. And if it landed, it would have crushed the drummer and the bass player. This is not, that's not, then the story is just about how they hurt it. Yeah, well, what Which happened was Herbie <laughs> and, and uh, the promoter, a guy named Fritz Rau, caught it in midair. That's what I heard. And they heard how it was there. Right. And, that, and, that and that if he threw had... it back onto the guys who threw it down. And then one guy rushed the stage and Herbie put his foot through his face. And, you know, it was getting pretty bad. And yeah. these, a lot of them climbed up on the stage. And when we took an intermission, they ran up on stage with wire cutters and chopped up a bunch of our stuff, and they d disabled the PA. And we had to come back and play a second part of the show, and there was about 30 cops there that refused to do anything because they were so outnumbered. And they just stayed in the back, so they're ravaging our equipment. So we said, okay, we're going to go down and finish the show. And we went back on stage, and we pushed all... There was about 200 kids on the stage. You had to get them off. And the Brodies rewired as much of the stuff as they could. Then as soon as we started playing again, things settled down. The only incident that happened in the second half of the show was a cherry bomb was thrown on stage and it exploded before it hit the stage and it went off about this far from Don Preston's head, causing his head to go like that, wow. which was not too swift. Yeah, but other than that, the yeah, other than that, they were pretty well contained for the second half of the show. And then just as we were about to close, the leader of the revolutionaries ran up on stage and grabbed the microphone and started ranting away in German. <laughs> now, I didn't know what the guy was saying, but it couldn't have been any good. So I right. said, uh, okay, you guys, a little louder. So we we uh, started turning up the volume of the instruments to the point where any vocal anything would have been inaudible. And we just built up this immense feedback grunt. That was, uh, <laughs> like the Don turned the organ on fuzz tone and put both elbows on all the keys. And just made this <laughs> horrible noise coming out. And... Uh, I turned up my guitar all the way and turned the amp up all the way and put it on uh, fuzz and every, you know, it just made this one loud feedback and it was just this wall of sound. The kids started moving toward the stage going like that. You know, the sound was so radical. So uh, the roadies and Herbie and the German promoters started dismantling the equipment and taking off stage piece by piece while we're making this feedback. And this guy's up there still trying to rant, you know, he's... I heard that because because you guys did go back out stage, you know, you gained a lot of respect from people. Which I think, do you think it would have really been a, an all-out riot had you not come back up there? No, that it would have been a riot. We probably would have lost all of our equipment. The Rolling Stones had a similar situation with probably about ten times as many kids at an open-air place there, and the kids charged down off the stands, and they did lose all their equipment. Just got destroyed. Is, 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 
Germany kind of like take the lead from England? I mean, the, I mean, like oh, there were a lot, you know, like as far as radicalism, was there a lot? Was that kind of German like, radicalism is its own brand. Is it political, pretty oriented? Uh, I don't know whether it's specifically political or it has something to do with some deep-seated nationalistic weirdness that happens when you drink that much beer and just have that kind of upbringing. Yeah. Because I discuss this a lot with the promoter over there who he's a, actually an attorney, he's a German attorney. And the way he explains it is after the war, when all of the uh, Nazi uh, school teachers were, uh, I mean, the whole Nazi regime was supposedly crumbled, but as soon as they said, okay, the war is over, reconstruct, you had the same teachers back in the schools. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, the teachers just stayed there and the kids were getting taught by the same people that were teaching their parents, you know, and some of that weirdness rubbed off. Yeah, the first time I ever saw you guys do your thing was it the Village Theater in New York City? Garrick Theater. Garrick oh, Theater. I saw it. The, the, the Grateful Dead would play next door at the Cafe Gogo. -Go. Yeah. And Sal Lombardo was on stage, and the whole time, a guy named Michael, who's a press agent, was brushing his hair. Yeah, so he's mean, not a press agent anymore. I guess no. it turned out to be a real geek. Yeah, well, that was the first time I ever saw him, and, I, and then I started seeing Sal in San Francisco all the time. That was my first, uh, that was my first flash of the mothers. <laughs> What's... I was there, too. What do you feel is like, you know, like people say, you know, like, well, that some of the albums are really fantastic. You know, do you think there's like a, there's a, like there's a, people don't, don't really understand everything you do. You know, like they understand the stuff with the lyrics, you know, and they get off on the humor of it, but they don't understand the, the orchestral numbers, you know, the, you know, the long things without. Well, the, I think that basically it comes down to this. The people who, who like what we do automatically probably just have a different kind of taste and maybe have a, a little bit more of a musical background to appreciate what's going on behind the lyrics. And the ones who uh, like some of the albums because the lyrics are probably just uh, interested in it only for a humorous thing. Probably wouldn't hear the music under any circumstances. I think generally the taste of not just the teenage audience, but all audiences is oriented to whatever happens to be generally popular during that season. So for instance, if soft rock is in and we do something that is not soft rock, we are out. Or if loud rock is in and we do something which is not loud rock, we are out. Or if something else is in, we are out. But chances are most of the time we are out and whatever else is, is going on because we don't function in accordance with the, the general trends of things. How do you feel about being a lot less out than uh, you were in 65? I mean, less, you know, but. a lot less out. I mean, 65 it was really weird. Freak out it was into really strange be, album. to be weird. <laughs> well, by comparison with what was being released in 65, Freak Out was awfully strange. But if you listen yeah. to it now, it's not strange right, at all. Right, mm -hmm. right. So the fact of the matter is that it's just the conservatism of the audience that has changed. You mean the audience is catching up there? No. You think the weird is or, or No, uh, I'd, I'd explain it this way. At the time that Freak Out was released, the things that were happening were like uh, uh, the birds and the, uh, the beetles and Herman and the hermits and things yeah. like that. You know, so, uh, oh, <laughs> she said her mother was a groupie. <laughs> <laughs> you think you think the you think the weird weirdness has become the norm now, though? I mean, like it's almost like it's like it, it's not it, it's not weird anymore. It's, you know, it's almost like it's almost like normal. No, it's like I don't think people really know what weird is. I think they accept superficial weirdness as being you know something really that's happening. You know? How many people do? Even the people who like the mother, though, you know, is musicians and respect them, you know, talents, whatever that, you know, how they feel about, how many people do you think really understand the music, you know, all the progressions and the changes and the, I mean, besides you, I mean, how many people do you think really understand it all? Conservatively? Yeah. Well, they, you know. Ten. Yeah. And are they, are they all people who play music or just people? I don't people? know, but I would just pick that out of the number. Does that make you feel strange? I mean, that, that some people really, you know, can get off on other people and just 
you know. Well, I can't do very much about it, you know. I'm not right. in a position to re-educate the total population of the world. I just go and do what I do, and if somebody likes it, that's really nice. That's very highly fortunate, but if they don't, there's there's not much in the way of uh, therapy that can be applied. Do you see yourself? I have to twist their arm in order yeah. to make them dig it. Do you see yourself, like, performing indefinitely, I mean, or, or do you see yourself coming to a point where you're going to sit back and, you know, look at all the things you've done and go into another trip, like writing or becoming a song and dance man, and, you know, changing, changing your whole trip from what you're doing now? Well, the hardest thing for me right now is just trying to uh, continue doing what I'm doing in the, in the face of uh, a certain amount of apathy, you know. I just just a question of how long I can enjoy doing that to a blank wall. What else, what else is happening in music or you know around Don't music? Ask me. <laughs> no, well, well just that 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 you feel you know that, that gets you off or that you feel is is that whatever real. will get me off is definitely irrelevant to 99% of your audience. So I'd say. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not a fact. Oh, that's a, a really a really frank question. What you know? What is your feeling about the average audience? Your your average audience. Any audience has a right right to be entertained. And all musics exist solely for the entertainment of the people who like to hear those various musics. People who like to hear Grand Funk Railroad are not only entitled to hear Grand Funk Railroad, but it's a good thing that they exist in order to entertain the people who get off on that sort of thing. I I still like to find out what else turn you know what else turns you on is it musically or it's outside music. Usually because orchestra music I like. Orchestra music. Yeah. What particular period? Kind uh, composer. Mostly contemporary orchestra music because there's much more interesting orchestration in it. There's more, uh, like from the late Romantic period up till now, there's more uh, orchestrational interest in, in that kind of writing. I'm not too fond of Baroque or classical periods because it's pretty cut and dry. You like jazz? Sometimes. You know, some of it's okay. I'm not a jazz fanatic by any stretch of the imagination. Had people ever turned, you know, like a portion of your music, though, jazz oriented? Yeah, they've done that. You don't feel that's where it comes from? Well, you know, there are jazz elements in there. There's all kinds of other elements, too. The problem is that most of the people who either write about it or talk about it don't have a su sufficiently wide musical background to appreciate the other elements that are in there. There are elements of Tibetan music. There are elements of all kinds of Asiatic cultures in there. There's elements of uh, various non-musical things that have been applied to a musical function that are all in, that used in those compositions. But unfortunately, the people that wind up discussing what we do uh, have to stick it into a category that's easily understood by the people that they're either writing for or broadcasting to. So they say it's jazz influenced or it's uh, rock this or it's rock that or it's, you know, they stick some simplistic label on it, which isn't fair to uh, what the overall thing is because it contains more elements than that. What's your, uh, what's your candid opinion of, of, of uh, the average critic? I would say that they would, it's a good thing that they don't repair televisions because <laughs> nobody would get a good deal. And yet, and yet, people are really oriented by critics. People go to movies because the critic says something is good, and if he doesn't say it's good, he can destroy an entire concept. A critic is the logical extension of the American educational system, and the American edu educational system exists only to train consumers, and the critic is an aid in the training of consumers, and the critic's life is devoted to the training of consumers. You think, you think the average critic is on a permanent bummer? No. And he really believes in what he's I saying. think that many of them feel that they are contributing great art. They have good jobs. Well. Right. Well, you know, like when you think about where, how a critic has progressed, you know, like in some I, cases... You know, let me say one thing. I'm talking about critics in the rock and roll sense. Right. People who write for your usual rock and roll newspaper. Right. I have no, no, no understanding or contact with any other real official critics who actually know music, you know, and get in there and let, you know, orchestra critics who might even study a score to make some some uh, statement about what they've seen or heard. But your usual rock and roll critic is a guy who probably could not join a group because he doesn't play anything and seeks the status of some association with the rock and roll industry which will help to get him laid. So he chooses the typewriter. And he goes home to the typewriter and he gets out some record and he writes up 
his first review and then hopefully sends it to publication X and says, I'll send this away and if they know what's good for them, they'll sign me up because I really know what's <laughs> happening as evidenced by this review I just wrote. And so that's the way they get work. Let me kind of change the subject to get away from this conversation. A little about Mother's History. Uh, recently we've been getting a lot of albums and things and rock into the radio station. We got this very interesting package about Jimmy Carl Black's album, Geronimo, Geronimo Black. Yeah. And in this package was this long kind of historical essay on how the mothers were formed. Well, and he claims that he formed the mothers. First of all, is that true? No, that's not true. Second and of all... he got you out of jail to fill in for someone else that had no, left? No, that's not true. That's not true. <clears throat> First, let me say this about Jimmy Carl Black and the process by which his record company is attempting to merchandise what they do. Yeah. I have no critical remarks to make about the quality of their music. However, he has no right to uh, apply his somewhat um, inaccurate imagination to the history and development of the mothers of invention. It was really interesting the way he said he got out of jail just to fill the place of this person, and then, you, then he went on six years of Frank Zappa's ego trip. It came with an album? At yeah. the same no, I, there is a, a, a disc. That I've heard the disc yeah, that comes with that. Yeah, it's a little bright promo. Okay, disc. well, yeah, I've got that. I remember Jimmy Carl Black coming to the uh, rehearsals, spending two weeks trying to learn how to play a drum fill in a song called uh, Any Way the Wind Blows. And all he had to do was go... Dun, da, 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 <laughs> took him two weeks to learn how to do that. That's what Jimmy Carl Black could play like when he joined the band. After he had been studying for a while and you know going out and trying to play something other than that he'd been doing in Kansas. He could function adequately in 5, 8, and 7, 8 and play a bunch of things that were far more complicated than the, the drum fill at the end of the cadence and any way the wind blows. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it makes me a little bit angry that uh, he represents me as somebody who has sort of tried to keep him obscure for uh, whatever number of years he specifies on the disc and so on and so forth because I've contributed to the support of his family at a time when Jim Black was spending more money on drugs and beer while his five kids and his wife were off someplace with the crabs in a hotel in New York, you know. No, get the crabs, but I don't care. Yeah, direct from the Albert Hotel, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I just, uh, I've lost all respect for Jimmy Carl Black. It's unfortunate, but I just think that he's... Yeah. Have you heard that album? Did you really listen yeah. to it? Yeah. As a matter of fact, he brought it over to the house the night they finished mixing it. He wanted to come over and play it on my system. <laughs> and then went out and made that little disc that uh, advertises the thing. Yeah. The one song in the whole album that has any value whatsoever is Siesta, as far as I'm concerned. It's a really nice, mellow flute thing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's funny how those albums never give any credits to the, the real instrumentation. I couldn't figure out who was playing that flute. I think it's Bunk. Bunk? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that he wrote it, too. Bunk, you know? I'm supposed to.